it's Dora and Coach from Tactical Hive. Today's video, it's all about sniper equipment. We're gonna get into the weeds on the gear that is unique to that mission. There you go. What's up next? All right, guys, today's video is brought to us by Vetter Holsters. Vetter Holsters are made in the USA. If you own a handgun, that handgun needs a place to go. If you're not shooting it and it's on your person, that's called a holster. So if you need one, these guys can set you up with pretty much any make model uh, that you can think of. Check them out in the description below. We use them here on the channel for making content as well as in our classes, both force on force and live fire. All right. Let's get back to the video. Back to the video. All right, guys. So, like I said, we're going to be deep diving into kind of that sniper reconnaissance role and the, the gear that's unique to it. Uh, outside of the schoolhouse, you don't really see this stuff that much, you know, um, but rural environments are coming back. Obviously, what's going on in Ukraine, there's probably a whole bunch of this stuff being used. Um, so it's a little bit of a out of vogue uh, skill set, but um, it's definitely something you're going to need to know how to use in the event you want to try to uh, remain hidden, etc. Yeah, I mean, urban sniping, you're mm -hmm. going to be pretty much loaded out like everybody else. You know, they either designate marshmen or whatever. You can have body armor, all that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, because you're rolling in an urban environment. Um, but you get out in the weeds, you're not carrying body armor. That just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, you want to be as slim and as light as possible and not get seen, you know, and, and, and be in a position to see what needs to be seen and report back. Yeah, that stealth and concealment kind of becomes your high priority as far as your defense versus ballistic protection. Though that is a hard sell with, uh, you know, the people that make decisions and sign off on operations. So if you are gonna be running a plate carrier and a helmet, okay. Um, if you're in one of those prolonged environments where you're out for a long period of time, maybe you'll be able to take that stuff off, get into more purpose-built equipment or you'll just mix and match in between based on the environment and situation. And what you're allowed to do. Yeah, exactly. What, what are you man? allowed to do? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I had a buddy who was in the field for probably like three days, got knocked off a ladder by an RPG, took a little bit of frag in the head, and all they wanted to know back in the rear was, why was he wearing his helmet? It's like, because you can't wear your helmet for three days straight, but yeah, that's another story for another day. <laughs> anyway, uh, when it comes to reconnaissance uh, equipment, you know, especially in a rural environment, you're going to need to break out some stuff that you maybe generally wouldn't have used in an urban one. Um, big thing is camouflage becomes more and more of a an issue, yeah. more of something you need to be able to rely on. Yeah, we've got thermal drones and Skynet Judgment Day stuff to deal with, but you know, every little bit helps so in the event you can get that helmet off you're probably going to have a helmet with you anyway because you need it for your night vision but in the daytime if you can get away with it you're not going to want to wear the damn helmet all the time unless you feel like you're in Im imminent danger you know you're hanging it out there you're tr you're being transported through red space to get somewhere yeah you're going to be fully kitted up for that because it's not on your terms you're pretty much being hunted at that point yeah. but if you can maintain stealth and concealment you know obviously the boonie hat that was all the rage back in uh, the good the Jungle War days. You know, this is a purpose-built one. It's got the mesh on top. It's got the uh, the ability to attach ghillie foliage. This so that, one, that one came with the uh, the net on top. Yeah, and this the, is a purpose-built yeah. for sniper operations. This, yeah, hang yeah, that all came came on it. This one's got a, a little bit more. Back in my day, a little bit less. You'd have had them fabricate that yourself. <laughs> yeah, you definitely would have. But uh, yeah, this one's got a little bit more, even still has a little bit of branches and things on it. And then this one, you know, is a little bit more streamlined. You could add to it as needed, but you just want a little bit to break up your outline because the human body, uh, excuse me, the human eye, really what it's looking for is shapes, shapes and colors. So obviously you wear camouflage patterns and then you want to break up the head and shoulders yeah, and, and head and shoulders uh, silhouette is is key. You, you you don't even know you're doing it, but your eyes going to cue in on that, especially if there's a little movement associated with it. And then this is a very very low pro. I mean, this thing scrunches yeah, down absolute nothing. You just have it in place of uh, you know if you weren't going to wear your helmet, you'd throw this on. These are awesome. I don't know who makes this one. I know everybody's going to want to know. 
I think it's like a one-off. Yeah, it, it's it's basically a military version of. Uh, yeah, you know, there's some civilian camouflage stuff, advantage and mossy oak and stuff like that that'll come with that kind of uh, uh, a setup because it's basically it's it's mesh with some really really lightweight fabric that's just sewed on it. You know, you got vent holes. And, yeah, hell, that's that's a nice little piece of kit, man. And again, doesn't weigh anything. Yeah, this is where your ounces start fucking. This one's made by Tactical Concealment. It's got a, a size band in it. Uh, this is one of the more Gucci modern ones that I use. I think I got issued this one in sniper school, but they're just great to have. You know, keeps it does help conceal you, keeps the sun out of your eyes so you can shoot. Um, this one. It looks like it was made by the same company, but it's not. I think this is more of a standard and then altered after the fact mm -hmm. boonie hat. This one's probably made like by Proper or one of those general issue companies. And this one was altered, like Coach was saying, um, after the fact by Riggers or... Liquid Nail yeah, and uh, uh, some, some sewing. Third party. Uh, but again, great to have. If you're going to be out there, um, highly recommend it. And then accompanying that is a shawl, not the full ghillie suit. You know, outside of sniper school, I've never seen anybody wear one of those. But uh, the shawl's great. It just covers up the head and shoulders. It's got the hood, just like in uh, whatever those freaking assassin games are. You can look super cool, you know, super <laughs> mysterious. And then you can be moody and, and broody. I don't know. But um, these are great. These fit right over the top of, like, your plate carrier or whatever you're wearing. Um, and it just gives you that added level of concealment. And it's not too cumbersome. You can pull this off, stick it in a bag very easily pairs right up with your hat you can put them in a compression bag together and just have them ready to go yeah and that uh that burlap that you know shedded burlap you mm -hmm. take whatever veg you got in the area throw a little bit in there uh that'll help with the color and and knocking out that that outline you know that head and shoulders outline will get mm -hmm. you killed just having a pair of like pruning shears in your kit so that you can easily yeah. Um, just attach a badge as needed and you can switch it up as your environment changes if you're going over long distance and then just something as simple as netting you know you just throw the netting on you know if you weren't camming up people don't wear face paint anymore I get it but if you needed to disappear you could literally just put this on at a distance you're, you, it, it, it seriously yeah. works like uh, doesn't seem like it up close be like oh yeah he's right there but mm -hmm. now nah, you can give him a little distance Add something that looks similar behind him. Yeah, yeah. It, you can it, throw the front of it up over the top of the uh, the rifle as well if you're in a fire, final firing position, if that makes sense. But it's just little stuff like this. It's super easy to keep. It collapses down to nothing. It weighs hardly anything. It's just quick little things that you can add and subtract from your kit um, make a huge difference. Uh, again, if you're in the field... And you can get away with not being wearing a super bulky plate carrier weighing you down heating you up don't wear a plate carrier shirt it just doesn't make any sense i'm um, a big part of this job is laying down on the ground it's it hides you mm -hmm. it's sustainable it's relaxing you can keep your focus for longer so if you're laying down on the ground guess what's on the ground critters bugs crazy stuff oh you know I mean, spiders, scorpions, yeah, I mean, I've seen millipedes the size of breaching charges. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This stuff's crazy. All right. It's like the dinosaur Godzilla version of a, one of those roly polies. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying. All right. So I highly recommend, again, back to the old school, having an actual combat top blouse style garment. Um, this is very similar to what I think the Army and Air Force are wearing in like Garrison with their name tapes, etc., um, I don't think it, I don't know if it's quite the same. It's got the, uh, what is now standardized operator top, shoulder pockets. Mm -hmm. This one zips up. It does not button. It zips. It creates a seal to keep the world off of my person. And again, very important. Very important. Ant. Creepy crawlies, baby. You know, all kinds of stuff. They suck. Also, the, uh, these have very, very good Velcro at the cuff. So again, I can seal off the world from my arm, my wrist. It's, I'm telling you guys, this, this stuff's important. And just having something like this that you can transition to, even if you were going to wear a plate carrier and you thought you were going to be in a nasty environment where you were going to get stung, bitten, have things lay eggs in you, etc. <laughs> um, having something like this and then again, even uh, spraying it down 
with uh, bug repellent. I know people are like, oh, the enemy can smell it and blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not, you know, but uh, my enemies were all chain smokers, so I don't think they can smell <laughs> anything. <laughs> but, uh, you know, who can smell me? The bugs, and I don't like the bugs. So definitely having something like this guy is definitely being able to switch back to it. Um, I highly recommend. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you're not running that on the plates, uh, Hydro, having a standalone one ready to go for different types of configurations. I've used the absolute heck out of this thing. I got issued it in 2004. I've done at least three or four combat deployments with it, and it's still going strong. Every once in a while, I'll put a little Listerine in there, you know, clean out the uh, chemistry experiment. But um, having something like this, you know, that you can transition to for that, you know, no plate carrier yeah mission i um, highly suggest don't want to run out of water become a jerk well, real quick when you get thirsty yeah and and honestly you're wearing that on your back and if you know the old days the canteen there's takes a lot more movement okay to get a canteen out and get a drink of water and put it away where that you've got the, your your straws right over your shoulder mm -hmm. you know the, so all the movement is is you turning your head biting on that sucker and and drinking yeah. so that it works good for that that camouflage that, mm -hmm. that yeah motion. Any excess movement, anything you can do to keep yourself as perfectly hidden as possible is going to make all the difference in the world. Because you just don't know all the time where the eyes are. Um, yeah, just little tricks like that, guys. Just being able to lay there, take little sips, you know, it makes all the difference in the world. Because anybody looking for you or not looking for you, what's going to get you noticed is movement first mm -hmm. and then color and then shape. And that's debatable, the shape and the color. I mean, obviously, you don't want to be wearing a bright orange tracksuit anywhere, you know, but... Um, and that's for, you know, visual, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, thermal, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, yeah. Not but, even yeah, gonna... you, We're just looking at, you know, most guys out there don't have thermal scopes. Mm -hmm. So wh who are you hiding from? You know, got to decide, you know, what, what your threat is and, and act accordingly. And then... Uh, Again, being able to run a chest rig versus a traditional play carrier. Uh, play carriers can be kind of a pain in the butt when you're laying prone or doing any other weird contortion stuff we sometimes have to do and out there in the real world as far as setting up a firing position. But these particular ones are awesome because they have a zipper and you can open them up. So when you're laying down, you have all this material, all this extra equipment, you can open it up pull it off to the side, and now you just have a flat, nice, body-only surface to work with here, and it just makes taking shots that much easier, that much better. Also, you know, if you have a lot of different configurations, obviously we have, you know, magazines with three different types of ammunition and caliber, and there's others, there's others. There's submachine guns, there's SCARs, there's uh, Soviet block stuff if you need to use that. So. You know, having different Rhodesians set up with different calibers, if you're, you're switching back and forth, you're in a hurry, great idea. You know, you just have a single standalone play carrier and you can switch back and forth between, you know, different platform to different platform. It just makes life a lot easier if you're living that life. If you're having one of those kind of deployments. Yeah, if you gotta switch out, you know, switch it up a lot. Yeah, switch sense. it up a lot. But again, this can be worn with or without um, plates. You can run your comms on here. You can run different types of ammunition on here. Oftentimes I'd run a pistol all the way up here because they didn't want anything low. You can run pistol ammunition on here. Uh, these things are great and definitely something, you know, a general purpose universal chest carrier, chest rig. Chest rig. Is, uh, is something I highly recommend having for these types of operations. Good old rigger's belt. Yep, good old rigger's belt. You know, have it on the pants. If you're not going to run the full bat belt, the full assault belt, range belt, what else do you call it? Well, you know, if you're going to be out in the woods humping stuff, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to have the, the least amount of weight on your hips is what you want. Okay, so you still want to have a rigger's belt because you can have a D-ring here in case you got to hook into a like, helicopter or, or, you know, whatever. That's your mm -hmm. safety line there. But... This just good, you know, sometimes you, you know, put the pistol on it. Sometimes, you know, you get a knife or your uh, uh, multi-tool. Yeah. That's, that's at very least you're going to have something to, you know, open a can or. A little bit, but something. you want to go as minimalist as possible because you just don't want to have things getting caught 
on snagged on i'm um, just keeping things tucked away because i mean the nature just has a way to reach out and just grab things and take them from you um we ran into a problem a serious problem in uh, the pacific war uh back in uh, world war ii and that is the the jungle was pulling grenade pins out you know because guys were just hanging those things on and like things would just disappear you're, you're going through the bush and things just get ripped off of your uh, your equipment that's where uh, the safety bales on grenade spoons came from they were originally called jungle bales and that's not even good enough for us because we throw a wrap of tape on yeah too so yeah, we uh definitely but you yeah that, pin the bale and your wrap of tape on there uh, you don't want those things going on so again having dedicated pouches you know pockets that velcro and button shut zippers things like that very important i don't want things hanging off you in that type of environment because you know it might just go missing yeah. uh balaclavas you know those are used masks are used for a lot of different reasons you know these ones are camouflaged you know uh face paint has gone completely out of vogue although lately but you know i um am old enough to have used it how i used it growing up playing navy <laughs> seals as a kid so i was totally used to it by then I prefer face paint if I am going to be in the field, but it does sweat off. You got to reapply it. If it's a cold environment, then yeah, I might actually wear one of these because it helps keep me warm. Uh, but if it is a hot environment, if I'm going to be doing a lot of hiking, anything like that, there's no way I'm wearing one of these. I am going to keep reapplying face paint. It's just my personal preference. Or if we can get away with not wearing any of it because we just don't think the threat's that big of a deal, sophisticated. Then we just won't wear it. You know, it just depends. It all depended on the time and place. Yeah. Gloves, uh, again, for all the reasons we talked about, why it was important to batten down the hatches, so to speak, in regards to your person, keeping out mm -hmm. the cr creepy crawlers. You will find yourself on the ground, crawling, slithering, you know, things of that nature. You don't want to suffer a hand injury. So having a fairly robust uh, type of glove, I highly recommend. Yeah, I mean, hands, you're always in something there, you know, you're always using your hands for stuff. And when your hands get all sliced up, even if it's like pampas grass or just, mm -hmm. you know, just the stuff that you're you're dealing with. Um, you know, you don't want that because when your hands start getting infected and nasty, you really can't do anything. So mm -hmm. a good pair of gloves, yeah, can't say enough about them. They're, they're awesome. Yeah. Um, one thing that was a big no-no traditionally with this type of mission was wearing any kind of glasses or sunglasses because of a reflective uh, surface. Mm -hmm. But eye pro is sometimes crucial in these environments, especially if you're working in like a squad size or, you know, the guy ahead of you is going mm -hmm. through and then a bush snaps back and hits you in the face. If it gets you in the eye, you're going to become a casualty. I had a very close call with that very early in my career when we were doing uh, long distance land nav up in the mountains. And um, so if you find yourself, you know, in an environment where that, you know, hazard, eye hazard is a thing, then go ahead and throw on eye pro. It's worth it. Um, if you're anywhere near where you think you're gonna be observed, are you gonna be moving fast enough to even have that happen, have a, a branch snap back on it? You shouldn't, you shouldn't. But uh, if you're just overlanding, in a relatively safe area, I recommend having iPro. Um, you're generally in the field, you know, you're going to be running a backpack. I would run the uh, Oakley M-Frame kit. You know, you have the clear lens, you've got the, sh the sunglass, dark lens, and then you usually have either a yellow or an orange or both to go with it. Yeah. And I would just bring it. Yeah. It's worth it. Early on in my career, we didn't have, we didn't wear iPro. And y y you get hit enough and little things happen. And you know, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, during the day, yeah, you know, you want you want really dark lenses, but you want something that's just going to take uh, you know some of that uh, the glare off because you get a glare headache over there just from just all that sun all day long. And at night, even on nods, I'd wear clear eye pro, um, and it saved my eyes. So I had an altercation where I, well I fell off a two story building, uh, middle of the night. Long story. Anyway. Uh, the nods tried to come through my, my face and uh, my Oakley's, you know, the reason I get to look at you with two eyes now is because I had clear eye pro on behind those knots. So uh, I'm a big fan of eye pro and, you know, lighter, fine, whatever, you know, 
keep it as nice as you possibly can because once it gets all scratched up and and you know hard to see through you'll stop using it so but yeah definitely i pro for anything i mean combat gets dirty there's shit everywhere mm -hmm. okay it will get in your eyes and if you can't see you can't fight so cover your eyes guys yeah that's a big one yeah um yeah, other you stuff you know so as we talked a little bit about face paint i always like to keep a little bit nearby for touch up you know makeup is important and it is makeup <laughs> it's tactical makeup and i'm totally okay with that uh or this is a tree stand so again in a veggie veggie uh forest jungle environment there are these things called trees and they're generally made of wood generally uh generally speaking and you can go ahead you can just screw one of these right into it there's also stuff you can find in other environments where this will work but if you find a, the perfect spot you know behind a tree and a bush whatever you can go ahead and just screw this right in drop the gun down and these things are awesome they uh it really opens up the uh the game that is stalking where you can have a, a very sturdy good spot to lay that rifle and be in the best concealment possible so i highly recommend these i think these are designed for hunting depending on how much you weigh and what you're screwing this into you could use it as a step uh though i haven't tried that why are you climbing a tree you're just gonna make yeah. noise and shake the damn tree yeah. well you know maybe you gotta see up and over and down maybe onto things sometimes you gotta take the high ground you know like god but god was always part. going high god's in a crane God's in a building, you know, I'm going to high ground, you know? Well, maybe you got to make the, maybe take the step, take the tree step. I don't know. Never tried that, but it's definitely worth it. It yeah, need to be, you know? But generally, you know, stay out of the damn trees, guys. Uh, <laughs> another thing is, um, you know, laser range finder. You guys all know what these are, but being able to laser things and give accurate readings as, as far as exactly how far away things are. Um, having one uh, with a compass built in is even better, but you know, yeah, and that's just your civilian ready one. Yeah. I mean, the military ones are a lot stronger, have the compass, yep. you know, lasers, all kind of cool stuff. But, you know, just having something like that is going to be up, you know, a lot better in most yeah. situations than just guessing the, your distance. You know, a small pair of binos, these are just kind of a universal uh, pair mm -hmm. that I would use, keep them in my kit at all times if I felt like we needed something stronger something larger something more purpose-built then you just go ahead and bring that along you know every mission's different and the equipment needed is gonna change but this is just a good small nikon universal uh set that i always had and hardly ever used because there's a big scope on my gun <laughs> i just use that yeah. <laughs> but you know if for, you're for some stuff if you're looking through a scope it looks like you're yeah aggressive you know if you don't want if you want to you know take that step back and just i uh, just look at your uh oh yeah my binos that uh it's a, less threatening to uh for plain clothes low visibility stuff or if you don't have a big you know sniper scope on a sniper rifle yeah. you're running a more traditional up close configuration okay. no. yeah these are great eight power eight ten power maybe would be the the most uh magnification mm -hmm. you want because then it starts getting really wobbly i you know eight's probably the the my go-to a nice lightweight uh, pair of, of, of 8X uh, uh, binos. Uh, it, it just helps. You know, you can see things, you can identify things farther, you know, threats and, and whatnot. Yeah, because, you know, everybody focuses on focuses in on what they think the primary job for all this is, and that's, you know, taking shots and, um, you know, exploring the, that pink mist. But um, really, it's all about being an observer and getting information um, out to everyone so that decisions can be made and situational awareness can be you know yeah i mean you're the, you're the eyes and ears you're you know you're gonna put your snipers in early and they're gonna watch the damn target and see who's coming who's going notice patterns um they're gonna come back and you know tell me you know what where the doors are what they're made of so i can kind of tailor my breaching stuff if that's you know mm -hmm. you know the mission or you know, whatever they're the commander's eyes on the ground, and that's 90% of the job. I mean, you know, taking that shot, that's the sexy part. But, man, the rest of it, that's, you know, that's that's where the real tradecraft is. And what um, also pairs well with these, if you have, you know, the room to carry it, or if you're going to be in the same spot for a long time, you might want to think about making a range card. Mm. And basically, to make a range card or take notes, 
you know, you want to bring things to write with. And honestly, just having a clipboard with you at all times so that you have a sturdy, good spot to write, take notes. Um, on the back of it, you can put ballistic data or whatever you want. Different weapon systems, you know, for your scope adjustments if you're still using that type of equipment. This is old. I think this is from sniper school. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it says my 300 Win Mag and my 762 by 51 dope on it. Yeah. My wind calls. Um, just having that kind of data in the heat of the moment, you know, if you're going to be in a sustained spot where you may be compromised is a good idea. And then range cards, you know, you just look out into your field of view, start lazing terrain features, figuring out how far away everything is. And that helps you make uh, faster decisions when things pop up, start playing whack-a-mole a distance. Faster adjustments yeah. uh, for your, your scope or just to call in, you know, if you've got, um, bigger guns yeah call it an already or um you know drop those air oh, aircraft yeah. range cards are huge because once things pop off yeah. man, you need to be focusing on the now and what's going on and trying to make calculations or guesstimating ranges at that point it diminishes significantly so anything you can do to set yourself up for success um, i highly recommend and just you know bringing stuff like this to write things down to reference is a a big big yeah. advantage oh and that, that's just a you know green wheel book but yeah. i mean they make the right in the rain ones yep. and all that there's a lot of really good stuff out there that's honestly you should have that on you anyway more compact and i got like Water. five of them over here <laughs> yeah. there you go that's that's a little more what, what you're going to find in yeah. the field yeah know. this is you know a little bit you know um, this is obvious everybody should have this really they make smaller ones larger ones uh you know these are made in tacoma like me great company great brand and uh yeah and, and you can write in the rain yep yeah. awesome stuff um nav gear you know i like to kick it old school with an actual compass you know protractor yeah. uh but everybody uses gps's i mean he sleeps with one on his person yeah. i have one on this next to my bed my other watch is a garmin but honestly if i got lost i'd probably just call my wife and have her find my iphone <laughs> app and just tell me where the hell i am and which way to go that's my current plan. Yeah, the current plan. <laughs> yeah. You get over in uh, places that may not have the same uh, satellite coverage. You know, well, I'm not going there because if I can't, <laughs> if I can't call home, I mean, I'm just not allowed. You know, I don't have authorization. So these days. Um, yeah, go map and compass though. I mean, this, it doesn't need batteries. Yeah. And if you know how to use this, you, you know, you can find yourself and, uh, and it doesn't weigh very much. Again, it's, you know, one of those things you, you have with you, you know, in case, you know, because the GPS batteries do die, even if everything's up and running, mm -hmm. you know, your battery dies, you better be able to find yourself, you know, and know where you 100%. are. 100%. You need to be able to do your job, complete your mission, keep yourself safe and get home uh, in one piece without any of your Radio Shack battery operated crap. Um, it's, that stuff's nice to have. It's mission enhancing, but it should not be essential to a survivability you know i mean it, it really shouldn't you should be able to run your equipment old school as a backup at a moment's notice um other stuff you're going to carry in that rural environment obviously is more of your landscaping as we'll call it you know you need to be able to chop up bushes branches etc so here's a tree saw folds up comes with this handy dandy little pouch yeah. i would just keep this tucked away in a backpack and then here is a Gerber e-tool for the same reason if you needed to dig in, move some things around and all, you know, environment dependent. But having this kind of stuff, you know, ready to go um, to be able to pick and choose as needed, guys, it's it's huge. Yeah, and then cameras would be the only other thing. Yeah, that, um... cameras, a uh, big deal, you know, taking pictures, relaying that stuff back. I've, I've heard stories back in the olden times. Uh, about actually having to develop pictures in the yeah. field. Yeah, but way, way back in the old days. I don't yeah. know if you guys know this or if you've watched previous content, but uh, one of the two of us was actually a photographer. Yeah. I was mate for the Navy. Yeah. Yeah, that was before I was a SEAL. It was a, I didn't know it was a SEAL source rate, but Lucky. yeah, turned out it was, uh, it was a good move. Um, but yeah, that was, you know, in my first uh, couple of platoons, I was the guy carrying the cameras and, uh, you know, I never did this, went sniper school, but I went in with the snipers and, uh, you know, I'd set up the camera and, you know, back then, you know, 
photography was a little more technical than it is now. Now it's everything's an 88 camera. You know, you don't really need to, to learn much how to do it or how to read the light. It all does automatically. I mean, we had a Nikonos, which is the waterproof, badass camera. You know, we basically just use for, you know, taking happy snaps underwater. But uh, you'd have that one and then just your good old film cameras because that's what you had. Yeah. You know, timed exposures and having, a, you know, knowing how to do all that stuff actually, uh, you know, it was more intrinsic to the game back then. Now you take a picture of something and you can send it up, you know, so that your commander can actually see what the hell's going on, you know, um, almost, uh, you know, in real time. So, right. uh, you know, we're getting there. Which yeah. May or may not be a good idea, but. Uh, yeah, I went through a two week course called uh, Photo Image Capture. It's part of the Sniper Pipeline. And then they just call it PIC because you're just taking pictures. Yeah. I went through a six month course called yeah. Navy Photomate School. Nice. Yeah. yeah. But the the one I went through was all digital, everything, and they just kind of ran you through the cameras and gave you that, you know, just a little bit to work with. But um all in all, it is very important being able to take care pictures, you know, and now everybody has a freaking iPhones. So I'm <laughs> guys can bring those out on ops nowadays. I don't know. Who knows what the kids are doing these days? Probably but bad cameras idea. are a big deal. They're a big part of the job and you know, having that capability to be able to get that information out, make products as they're called, send them up in situation reports, et cetera. Um, a good target package. Again, and yeah. huge part of the job. Yeah. And then uh, the most important and coolest part is the actual GATS. Mm -hmm. So up next. Mm -hmm. All right guys, so as far as you know, your primary weapons, your sniper rifles, you know, the sky's the limit. This is a very generic uh, 308 AR-10 variant. These are very popular. Uh, we also use the uh, the SCAR variants. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, I guess the 417s were being used as well in these roles. Yeah, all in the 7.62. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, which was, fills its niche, right? Mm -hmm. 7.62. Uh, reaches out and hits harder than uh, than 5.56. So yeah, you could run, you know, a 5.56 or a 7.62 configuration. We had this awesome gun. I think the best one Reed Knight's Armament ever came out with was uh, the Mark 12, which was just a sniper rifle version of the M16. Those things were awesome. Yeah. But eventually they went the way of the Dodo, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but yeah. 11. I mean, this is not a Mark 11. This is no. just a civilian put together, you know, mm -hmm. uh, LR 308 for you, uh, you know, guys, that that matters too. It's not yeah. an AR-10, but yeah, I mean, this is you know, it's set up for uh, you know, engagements out to uh, easily out to seven, seven fifty, eight hundred. You know, you could uh, this will definitely get the job done. Yeah, the uh, the scars. You know, we had the Super Scar, the Mark Twenty. That was the actual like purpose-built sniper rifle. Dude, that thing was about an eleven hundred yard gun. Personally, from personal experience. The, uh, the regular SCAR, I would take the trigger packs and the buttstock and all the nice accoutrements off of the Super SCAR and I'd throw them onto the regular SCAR. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get that thing out to 700 on iron sights. It wasn't pretty, you know, and this is just training. I was shooting at a known distance uh, target. You know, I was hitting into like the shoulder, or the thigh, the gut, the chest, you know, the rounds were all over the place. But uh, on iron sights at 700, and that's proned out with a bipod, the great guns. And, the, and again, with the full sniper package, the 15 power night force, that was an 1100 yard gun. So you could expect with that single weapon system to be able to within reason get out there, you know, to that click, you know, give or take range. Now, if you needed to go with something a little bit bigger, you know, if this wasn't gonna cut it in even the 308 or 556 variant, you know, that's okay, but you'd start to run into needing that kind of dual primary setup. Mm -hmm. That's up next. Right. Something like this bad boy and 300 win mag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so now we've got the bolt action. You know, it does take the same mags as our Mark 13s, right? Is that a Mark 13 action? No. Well, uh, this is a Remington 700 action. Yeah, well, it, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, so it's basically the same thing, uh, but again, it's a civilian version. I don't have the the money or the clout to uh, yeah be AI for... stock. I have AI stock. Like yeah, I, I'm I'm not trying to clone anything or you know not not when it comes to this. 
but it's good to have that capability to reach out, you know, past that that magical uh, thousand yards. Well, how far have you had this? Have you shot this thing? Uh, about 1250 as far as I've gone with it, but okay. uh, um, it's got more legs to it. Yeah, it, there's, you know, the, you know, the, it's all custom stuff. The Criterion barrel, uh, you know, the custom stock, all that. You know, and okay, I don't have the uh, the night vision equipment, but you know. If I were to get into that and want to shoot things at night, you want to have a little bit piece of rail here that you can drop in front. So now, you know, you get clip on night vision or clip on thermals um, that they're out there. But, uh, you know, one thing at a time. <laughs> yeah, one thing at a time. But when you are running, you know, a bolt gun, generally speaking, um, unless you were rolling really deep with a lot of other people with... Uh, faster shooting guns you would probably want to dual hat it where you would run this maybe in a backpack you know have the ammunition kind of separated and then you'd run you know a smaller you know i guess pdw personal defense yeah. weapon or maybe you go with something as big as like say an m4 traditionally just depends yeah. on what you have our guys you know if you're running a, a sniper team mm -hmm. you know uh you can have one of these yeah, and then the other guy's probably going to be running with uh, the, the Mark 11, the uh, 762, which was actually referred to as a sniper support weapon. It's not really a sniper rifle, but it was pressed into that, uh, you know, for urban, where you're not getting 1,000 yard shots normally. You're getting, you know, maybe 200, you know, tops, but you still want that 762 to, uh, to, for effect on target and, and penetration. Uh, goes through a a little bit more at distance than your 5.56 does. But I'm yeah, not but saying 5.56 won't kill you, but... It does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're running one of these, so, you know, traditionally a guy would run a 10-inch gun as a PDW at M4, and then uh, you'd also see, depending on the environment, depending on the type of operation, you could see a submachine gun like an MP5 or an MP7 being pressed yeah. into service. Well, guys are even using the uh, Mark 23, four, you know, suppressed 45. Yeah. I've, you use that one to clear the building to up to your, you know, your sniper position because it was quiet. I worked <laughs> with guys, snipers early on in my career that did use the Mark 23 as kind of like an almost primary weapon for clearance. You know, it had the big can on it, didn't have any red dots or anything. It didn't have a laser module. Yeah. On the, nobody used that. I never saw anybody use the thing. It was dead, dead and dated by that point. But, um, yeah, running that Mark 23 for clearance and then having a sniper rifle on their back, even with like a Mark 11, which is a full-size AR-10 variant, or the Mark 20, which replaced mm -hmm. it, you, know, you got to have something else for clearance. I did run a, a, a Mark 20, or a you know, scar-heavy Mark 20. I would go back and forth in the helo sniper role. Um, sometimes I would even use an M4, but if I thought I was going to need the full-size rifle to accomplish what I needed to, I, would br I brought an MP5 SD in yeah. the uh, the helicopter. If I needed to get down the rope and get onto the boat for whatever reason, I was not going to be clearing with a 20, you know, no. full size, you know, the Mark 20 is about as long as this thing. So yeah, I would switch to that. Um, but you know, that was just me. Um, but nowadays guys are running uh, Rattlers in place of PDWs. All the uh, MP5s and 7s are almost completely out of the inventory as far as I know. And uh, so just having something as simple as this to maybe keep you safe out to about 200 or so, definitely a good idea. And it's small, it's compact. I mean, you, you know, you're not reaching out very far. You know, you put your uh, subsonic uh, mm -hmm. blackout in that bad boy, throw a can on it, and yeah, that'll that'll get you there. And it's it's only slightly larger than that uh, Mark 23. Yeah, I know. <laughs> God, the Mark 23 was ridiculous. Like I never once carried it in the field because I just couldn't justify it over the MP5. Like, I just, it was ridiculous. But some guys liked it, you know, for whatever reason. But again, like, my buddy, a really good friend of mine, he was a point man sniper, he did use it. But he had us with him, you know, and even like a six, seven man team probably had three or four belt guns, depending on what we were doing. And everybody else probably had a grenade launcher. So you can get away with a lot when you hang out with people that know how to carry heavy things, which I definitely did. But just something to think about, you know, if you're going to go with something that's, you know, very nats ass, very purpose built for maximum pen or distance, you know, be able to dual hat and carry something like this is uh, highly recommended. Yeah, you got to get to the place where you're going to be using this thing. Mm -hmm. And in order to get there, 
Yeah, you're gonna need something else because you're not clearing rooms with this bad boy. I don't care who you are. Right on. Yeah, exactly. It's been done. There's legend. Yeah. There's legend of point blank CQB kills with uh, 300 win mags. Uh, wouldn't recommend it though. Yeah, wouldn't recommend it. Those guys are getting getting cocky, but you know that's okay. Weird stuff happens toward the end of deployments. You know, you're like, oh man, I wonder. I wonder if. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. uh, that's when it's time to go home. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It usually hits around the four month mark. <laughs> um. Anyway, guys, this is just kind of a quick uh video about some of the things that you know if you're going to find yourself in you know specifically a ur rural environment over an urban and if you're going to start trying to fill that recce sniper role you know being able to change up your kit you know going back to the old school when this stuff was you know on the forefront of tactical capability and you know being developed as a probably what was going to happen in the next war you know, because that's how militaries operate. You know, I think, um, you know, definitely being able to switch back to this older way of doing things is a must. Because if you go into the woods dressed like you're going into the city, it's not going to work out. It's uh, it's very becomes very uncomfortable very quickly. Yeah, I mean, when I started my career, it was basically with that kind of stuff. I and mean, we mm -hmm. body armor. Nobody had body armor. Nobody had helmets. You know, you just you went out and you, you, you did the job. Um, and but we we're looking at, like Dor said, you know, the previous war was Vietnam. So we're figuring, oh yeah, we're gonna be running around in the woods someplace. Well, in, in real life, there's nothing out there anybody wants anymore. You know, for the most part, um, you're going into houses and towns and you know, it's not a hooch anymore. It's a freaking city, whether it's in a, Afghanistan and it's made of rocks and timbers or, you know, uh, you know, compressed earth uh, or downtown Baghdad. You know, those are the two environments that we found ourselves in a lot. For, and um, yeah, you can't wear the same kit and expect the same outcome in both, uh, both scenarios. So getting back to this, uh, you know, if you can, if you're, it's available to you, uh, that's, it, it's an option, you know, that's all it is. Yeah. It's an option to be able to pick and choose going back and forth. Um, it all just depends on, you know, what primary role function are you trying to fill? Maybe even bring, try to configure equipment to handle a secondary, even tertiary role or a function. But, you know, every op's different. Every environment's different. You got to figure out what works for you. This is just uh, what has worked for us in the past and moving forward. If we were going to go from a urban environment out into the wilderness, we would definitely revert back to this, you know, more old school method of doing things. Definitely. And guys, I, as always, if you like this content, like, subscribe, leave us some comments. All right, guys. Store Coach, out.